especially when we're working in, in jurisdictions where we're so close and we work as, as multiple agencies in one to continuous, you know, scene at the time. So couplings are, are manufactured in different ways. They're casted, they're extruded, and they're drop forged. Everybody probably knows more about any of that than I do. But, you know. So threaded couplings have two kinds. Your male and your female. Okay? Male is the threaded end, female is the swivel end. <coughs> we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about search and rescue and stuff like that, is using your hose to get us out of trouble and knowing which side is the male end and which side is the female end so that we knew which way we needed to go to get out. So the male end just has the single lug. The female has the lugs with the smooth shank on the back side. So that's how we always tell the difference. And we'll talk about that little notch here shortly that exists in the female and the male side. That's, that's important for for a reason it's been built in there so we always want to connect com co uh, connect couplings hand tight to avoid any damage to the coupling and the gasket itself and what we usually end up doing is we'll connect them hand tight and they'll start leaking a little bit so we'll get our hydrant wrenches out we'll crank down on that bad boy and what's it end up doing to the gasket pinches it just a little bit more so the next time we put it hand tight it leaks a little more so we crank on it a little bit more, and the gasket gets a little bit more damaged, a little bit more worn. Or in some chain, in some areas, the gasket itself is just worn, worn down. It's old, it's frail, it's brittle. So when it actually does get used, we end up just destroying the gasket, and it's just going to leak. So hand tight doesn't work. But for the most part, you ought to be able to just connect a hose hand tight and be happy with it. It should just not flow water through it or have any leaks and any sorts in it. But unfortunately, because we don't get to use them all the time and as readily as we'd like to, you start having issues with leaks. So different cuts, different sizes, different gaskets. So the indicator that they're showing on there is, is specific and it actually has a name and it's called the Higby Notch. Okay, so the Higby notch was basically designed that it is the cut from the male and the cut on the female. That if you line the Higby notch up on the male to the female, as soon as those are lined up, that means as soon as you make the spin, it automatically starts the thread. If you don't line them up, then you've got to spin until it starts to grab. Okay. Efficiency-wise, speed-wise, it helps just to make sure that they, they connect faster. Um, if anybody's done any, any competitions or anything where that speed is a factor when it comes to connecting hose, that's where it matters the most. So that's what is called the Higby notch. And basically what it does is it indicates the cut on the male and the cut on the female side. Different kind of outside connections are the parts on the outside that we need to know about. Okay, we have the rocker lugs. Rocker lugs are the most common, especially in the newer style hose. Um, those are the ones that our hydrant wrenches and our, our spanner wrenches connect to. The recessed lugs, um, don't see those too often, just because they're, not, they're just so uncommon. If we don't have them, then we don't have the correct tools to use on them. And the pin lugs, uh, pin lugs were pretty common um, probably 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, I've seen some still exist, but it was on some old hose. Um, our spanner wrenches will work, the older style spanner wrenches. If you see the spanners that kind of got that little notch cut into the end of it where it hooks to our rocker lugs, that's what those are for. They're designed for those pin lugs. They all work the same way. <coughs> so the female end on the rocker lug, which is through this side, that's the side that will spin. Everything else is in a stationary position. Non-threaded couplings, quarter turn, and storts. Most common version is the storts coupling. That's the one that we know the most, especially in this area. Um, I have not ever seen a quarter turn coupling. Um, 
I will tell you on the old Firefighter 1 exam that that, uh, that coupling wasn't one of the questions. Because these are called sexless couplings. Uh, the reason they're called sexless is that it doesn't matter which side of the hose you have, you can hook up to either side. Where on the male-female end, like here, male can't hook to male without an adapter, female can't hook to female. Where in the sexless style, especially on the storts, it doesn't matter. Okay, I can hook up one side of the hose or the other side. I can flip the, that one piece around and it all hooked the same way. So the way the storts works is you can see the two lugs that sit just on the outside of it. And just on the other side, there's a recess section. So that lug on each one will fit into the recessed. And then with a the turn, they will lock into it. And there actually is locking pins that hold them down. So in order to get them to break apart, somebody has to hold the lock pin on one side and the lock pin on another to allow it to break free. Um, I will tell you under pressure that trying to get a storts coupling apart is not easy. Um, I can't say that it's impossible, but I will tell you it is not easy. Um, there's a lot of water in there, so if you do ever have to try and break that apart, be very careful, um, not only by the weight or by the end by the weight itself of the hose, but by the pressure that's probably in that hose. Objective two, we're gonna talk about the different causes of prevention methods of hose damage, basically how to make sure that, you know, that expensive piece of equipment that we have a lot of, and you're talking anywhere from 500 to 1,000 feet of what could be some very expensive appliances on your truck, how are we gonna keep it from being destroyed both by ourselves and by lay public because they don't get it. Mechanical damages can be anything from slices, rips, abrasions, can be crushed, can be cracked, um, all different things that we're going to deal with basically through wear and tear itself or just from plain misuse or just idiocy from people. So with hose in itself, we need to make sure that we're avoiding contact with any sharp object. Okay, sharp objects can be anywhere from curbs to saw blades to anything that's going to basically damage it with <laughs> slicing it, cutting it, <coughs> anything like that. If you have the ability and you can protect them with, with hose rollers or salvage covers, um, that is the best way to do it. I understand that when we get into high pressure situations that that's not always possible. Those things do exist. Um, hose rollers you're going to find work really well if you're doing the, like industrial areas and the hose actually has to go up on a roof. That's a good area for it because you've got that nice 90 degree edge that we need to protect it. Salvage covers if you don't have that. Um, car fires, you know, being careful around car fires for going around the home, going around the vehicle and getting it caught on something. So broken glass when we're going in the window, we need to make sure that we clear that out. Even going through a doorway, if you're going through a, a commercial residence and you're going through a commercial style glass doorway, we need to make sure that if we're gonna pull it through that door for some reason, because we haven't gotten that door open, that we protect that edge the entire time with that broken glass that we may not see. So that's where our salvage covers come into play, just to kind of give that extra protection. The smaller the diameter of the hose, the more ability for it to have damage, um, especially like Wildland hose, one inch hose. One inch hose does not like concrete at all. Um, it does not handle that abrasive texture of concrete. So the more it rubs and more it rubs on, on it, it will actually damage the hose. Um, prevent vehicles from driving over hose. And we'll show a couple tools that we use to try and prevent that. Um, however, the best way to prevent that is just not to put it in harm's way 
I guess was one way to say it. Uh, try not to cross traffic or lay it where traffic can basically be dumb enough to try and drive over it. Um, saw a video the other day or a picture the other day of a story of a department that had gone and hit the hydrant, was laying a hose, and a passerby, Lucky Lewin or whatever, tried to drive around, drove over the hose, got the coupling <coughs> stuck underneath their car, and then pulled out an extra two or three sections before they stopped, and one of the sections actually hit the pump operator as he was trying to stop them and caused injury there. So see stories all the time of people trying to drive over hose that is pressurized thinking that they'll just be able to drive over it no big deal uh, it's not a speed bump so it will cause damage to that hose and they don't care you know just up and over they go so and that's where those hose ramps and those hose bridges come into play um, water hammer so this is something that we definitely need to avoid, and it's something that we don't think about, but your pump operator will definitely know you're doing it. So water, happen, ha water hammer happens when we open and close the bail too quickly. And basically what it does is when that water stops suddenly, and especially it happens more when we close it quickly, so that water's flowing at its nice, normal pressure. And when we shut that bale too fast, it causes that water to stop, and then the reverberation works its way back through the hose. It'll go through the hose. Um, if it hits hard enough, and the hose diameter is big enough, especially in two and a half, three inch hose, it will cause pump damage. Um, and I have actually known that it has caused hydrant and water supply damage to the city line um, we had that happen in Hull one year I was water fighting it was the last year we did it in Hull because somebody had shut it down too hard and ended up cracking a city line from the water hammer um, I've also seen two and a half jump off of the ground my waist height right at the pump right at the truck because of water hammer so it's not only damaging to the equipment, but it's also dangerous to bystanders standing around or our fellow firefighters standing around who might be working in that area that could be hit by that. Chafing blocks. Chafing blocks are basically something that we can put underneath the hose as it comes off of the truck to avoid damage <coughs> of abrasion on the concrete in working predicaments. Um, Something maybe the pump operator will put on when he's got a little bit of time as he's waiting for everything else to get into play. Excessive pressure, that also is going to come from our pump operator. Um, basically, it's going to be his or her job to make sure that he's putting the correct amount of pressure into the line. Because um, remember, if that water's not flowing and it's just holding it there, and if he's trying to, if he's got that pressure built up, then it's got nowhere to go. And if it finds a weak spot in that hose, it's going to know about it and it's going to leak out of it. So deploy away from debris for obvious reasons. You know, it avoids any damage to the hose, any damage to appliances, stuff like that. So change the position of folds, and we'll talk about that when we get into hose lays, making sure that we don't put folds on top of folds. Um, we offset them. And we always clean our hose before we reload it. so that it avoids dirt and debris and any other things that we may have dragged that hose through to be sitting on that hose for extended period of times because unfortunately we don't have the luxury of fighting a fire today and fighting a fire here in about two or three days where the hose is constantly getting used, constantly getting uh, cleaned and everything else. So, you know, we may not have pulled the hose off, a section of the hose off for six months, unfortunately. So if there's something sitting on it, especially some type of chemical that's had a lot of time to work its way to getting through the outer sheath and into the, the rubber of the neoprene. Thermal damage, when we expose it to excessive temperatures, uh, heat, cold, direct flame contact, um, it can char it, obviously it can melt it, it'll weaken it, it'll dehydrate the linings. 
if that does happen, if it does come in direct contact with the plane, you know, depending on the, the extent of time, depends on the extent of damage that'll happen. You're looking at anything from, if you're in the middle of using it and you start losing pressure and you're not sure why, you know, the most common time we will see direct flame contact or direct heat contact is normally on grass fires, wildland fires. Uh, just because we're not really paying attention, we're dragging it through the black um, and we didn't quite get it out. So, Different ways to prevent thermal damage from fire hose. Obviously stay away from the heat when we're in the cold, making sure we <coughs> get all the water out of it after using it. Making sure that um, if we're using it in cold, extreme cold environments, that we're actually moving water all the time so that we don't have that static water just sitting there. So, you know, in extreme cold temperatures, that water can be sitting there. Remember, it's coming from underground, so it might be 65, 70 degrees if we're lucky. So just sitting there for an extended period of time, depending on how long we're on scene, you know, you could start having some damage. Uh, there was a picture that came out a month ago um, of hose that actually had iced up because they weren't flowing water. I think it was a three inch, two and a half, three inch hose that had just a huge ice chunk into it. So. Organic damage is something we deal with. It's that mildew mold. Um, if we're putting wet hose back into a hose bed, it's got whatever else on it because we didn't clean it properly. Uh, we may have left soap on it or whatnot. We put it back into the hose bed wet. We didn't properly dry it. Six months later, we actually end up pulling it out. We look at it and it's got black mold on it or mildew built up on it. All of which is damaging to the outer liner of the hose, which in turn will weaken it. So the best way to prevent organic damage is to scrub it. Nice soft bristle brush. Don't want to use um, a high water pressure. Um, try not to use a pressure washer. We do. What's that? We do. I know. We used to down there. No more. You know, just a simple garden hose or, you know, if you happen to have got the ability in the room, just use a nice, uh, like an inch and a half, an old inch and a half with a, high, a nozzle on it. Just spray it, spray all the debris off, take a soft bristle brush onto it, scrub everything off of it. Um, wouldn't even recommend using chemicals on it or soap or anything else. Just <coughs> scrub the stuff off of it, rinse it back off, and then however you choose to dry it, whether you use a drying cabinet um, or a uh, dry rack. Um, here we have dry racks on the wall. So I think we all dealt with those when we did the search and rescue that day of crawling underneath of them. So, you know, like Sioux City, they actually, station, station one has a drying tower. So when they get done using theirs, they bring it in, clean it, and hang it on the, the line and then it gets hoisted up however many feet and it sits there and just dries in the tower so obviously chemical damage that we can deal with petroleum products paints acid alkalis uh, you'll see that a lot when we're dealing with car fires so gasoline oil stuff like that or industrial fires um, maybe going through garages or storage units and stuff you'll find some of that stuff that's where we're going to find that battery acid. Um, and it doesn't even have to be so we dragged it through. It can be as simple as just having water runoff coming from a scene and it's picking up that stuff as it goes through and running down the curb line. Because um, that's where we ran our five and a half or five inch supply line. So preventing chemical damage. You know, avoid the exposure, scrub and wash the contaminated hot hose lines, everything we've just talked about. You know, test them periodically. Um, I believe NFPA states that you actually should test your hose once a year um, and maintain records of that. Um, I understand that it's not the quickest thing in the world to do, um, depending on how much hose you have. 
And when you test it, you test everything. We don't just test the attack line. You've got to test supply lines as well. So it takes a lot of water, it takes a lot of people, and it takes a lot of time to test your hose as you're supposed to. Um, I think inch and a half, inch and three quarters, I think. I think when you pressurize it and get it up to pressure, <coughs> I think it has to hold it for 20 minutes. So depending on how many sections you do at a time, you know, if you've got a hose tester that most hose testers, the new ones, will do four test spots. So if you do four and you do 200 feet per, so you're looking at 800 feet of hose to test. You gotta build the water and get all the water filled into it, get the air re leaked out of it. Once that's done, then you gotta build the pressure to it, and then you gotta hold it for 20 minutes. So you're looking at anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes just to test that 800 feet. Well, how many feet of inch and three quarter attack line you guys got on a truck? You know, you know, just in two pre-connects, you probably got 400, and that's just in pre-connect. That's not extra supply lines that you got, so. You know, and dispose of according to your local SOPs. Um, most SOPs will tell you once it's once it's out of service, it's out of service, and you just get new. Um, you know, some of it can be used for other things. Um, you know, Armstrong that'd be something for. You know, water fights you could use. Esterville, who's not here yet, he, you know, something they could use. You know, just because it's old hose and it's not something that we need to worry about damaging and having issues with. If it goes bad, it goes bad. If it busts, it busts. We're not out of anything anymore because we'd already taken it out of service. Corrosion is a type of damage that weakens or destroys metal hose parts. Uh, we have two different types of couplings. We have the old brass style and the aluminum style that we have now. Um, brass can be a lot softer metal, so it takes a lot, lot less force to cause damage to those couplings, especially the threads. Um, and that's why when we roll hose, and we'll, we'll work on that in a little while, when we roll hose, we always roll it and we always make sure that the male end is protected just because we want to avoid any damage to that. Excuse me. I will tell you when it comes to the coupling side of it that when brass is tight, brass is tight. Okay? Once you get it hand tight, it's tight. Aluminum on the other side, on the other hand, um, when it's hand tight, it may not be tight yet. Because as soon as you put pressure to aluminum, it actually forces that hose out and you can actually spin the, the coupling a little bit more. So, so unfortunately brass is difficult to get a hold of. Uh, most everything is aluminum coupling now just because it's not as susceptible to damage. Um, it's a little bit cheaper for the coupling side of it, so cost efficiency wise. I couldn't tell you the last time I'd even seen brass on a truck. Um, the only time I see it is, is on weekends when I'm out. out at different departments participating in some of that stuff. So, Age deterioration. Um, unfortunately, as time goes by, everything gets old. It gets worn out. So we need to remove and replace those holes, loads periodically. Um, you know, if you've got a hose load that's been sitting there and it hasn't been, hasn't moved for a year, you know, probably isn't a bad idea to go ahead and take that hose load out, put a new set of hose into it, and let that other stuff kind of breathe <coughs> a little bit, let it stretch its legs. So, you know, when you're loading a hose, you know, if you've got a, a load that are a, a, a loose fold into it, you know, make sure you get it nice and tight, um, keeps the air out of it. Makes that load look a lot better, react a lot better when we're pulling it out. So, and if you're using a drying tower, as soon as it's dry, we need to get it out because that's undue pressure that's going to be forced on that one particular spot. Um, even in drying racks, when we put them on the drying racks, we tend to, <coughs> to fold them around that corner sometimes a little tight. So we get undue pressure put on certain spots of that hose. 
And that's just going to cause damage to the exterior. And if the hose dries long enough, it'll cause damage to the rubber and the neoprene on the inside as well, causing weak spots. And the last thing we want on the tack hose is a weak spot. So we're going to go over inspection, care, and maintenance of and those different methods in the fire hose. So follow schedule. Obviously, I get it. It's you know, if you if you were to go through and try and schedule everything that we're supposed to do on a regular basis in the fire service, on a volunteer side, I get it. It's not easy. It's if we tried to do all the inspections and everything else we did, I'm not sure where we'd get any other training in because we'd be too busy trying to inspect ladders at one meeting, hose at another, gear at another, SCBAs at another. There's a quarter of our year gone already. So, so when we're dealing with the coupling ends. Check for damage in our threads, making sure that there's no threads that are bent, uh, chips, stuff like that. Check that gasket. Take that gasket, make sure that it's there, and if it is there, take it out. It should be able to come easily out without being stuck in there. And once you've done that, you ought to be able to take that gasket and fold it in between your fingers, and you shouldn't see any cracking or deterioration in that gasket at all. If you do, just replace it. Um, and actually not a bad idea to have extra gaskets on hand. I know in our pumper here we have extra gaskets available in our in the little can in one of the cabinets. Actually it's inside the truck in one of the doors. So we have that ability that if one of our gaskets go bad that we can just pop it out and put a new one in. So and then check for loose couplings, making sure that that coupling is, is in its proper place. So, and that's stuff, the best time to do that is usually when we're doing water tests or hose testing, so we can test each and every one of them. Washing the hose depends on the type of hose that you got. You know, if you've got the abilities to use the drying of the hose washing machine like they got pictured on the right hand side, great. <coughs> um, if you don't, then like I discussed a little earlier, nothing but a simple garden hose and a soft bristle brush is really all that it takes. It'll get almost everything off that you need. So, you know, those hose, hose washing machines are great, but, you know, it also take up a lot of room, and if you don't have a lot of room, and you don't have the, the hose going through it on a regular basis, it's just kind of a, a neat tool that you just have sitting there that looks pretty half the time. So, sometimes the best thing to do is just to, to do it manually. Not to mention, as you're doing it manually, you can, you can really, see the hose and focus in on it so different types of drying here's a drying cabinet notice they've got it loosely rolled goes in the cabinet you know sets for a certain period of time to me it looks like it's a uh, that subway and they're gonna proof bread so once again neat tool to have but if you're not using you know, <coughs> if you're not using hose a lot you're not doing a lot of a lot, of whole, a lot of house fires or fires in general, then, you know, just having a nice simple drying rack hanging on the wall works just as well. So, storage racks. So they've got them all separated. Best way to, best work for this is, you know, if you've been out on a, on a, a scene, and you've used hose, that you can put that hose on the drying rack and grab what you need as replacements and take it back out. So This one's a mobile one. Um, I've never seen a, a mounted one. Most of them you see are, are mobile. So One of them caution lines, never store solvents, petroleum products, or other chemicals close to hose, fire hose or couplings for obvious reasons. Um, you know, you spill, <coughs> spill one solvent in an area near hose and you could ruin four, five, six sections of hose pretty quickly. So, so we always want to keep them stored in a clean, well-ventilated room. Um, obviously, preferably away from products that can damage it. Um, always try to avoid excessive exposure to sunlight when we're storing them and always pack them loosely so that they can breathe. You know, protect the couplings. We're always going to roll that male side on the inside whether we're doing a single roll, a donut roll, 
a twin roll, whatever, that male end always gets protected because that's the most damaged, most possible way to damage a uh, thread is having that out, which is funny because when we unroll the hose, what do we do? That male end goes <coughs> flinging, and what's it do when it hits the end? You know, so and we tell you to protect it, and the next thing we do is we're shooting for that perfect unroll, so that thing just rolls straight out like it's supposed to, and the last thing it does is flop that male end right out. So when we're dealing with those sexless couplings, make sure we make sure we don't let any dirt get collected in that coupling um, that causes damage to gaskets and could prevent a good seal happening or cause difficulties just making the connection in itself. Female male, we've talked about it a couple times, both in this chapter and other chapters. You'll see on the top of the female picture, what's that called again? Right up here, what's it called? Pigby notch, there we go. Pigby notch. <clears throat> I love that. Avoid dropping or dragging the hose. But once again, what are we going to do with that male end when we unroll it? Don't drive over it. We've talked about that. Told a couple stories about it. Like I said, when we're washing the hose, let's make sure we inspect it as we go because you're not going to just wash one side. You get to roll it over and you're going to look at the other side as well. And remember, when you're washing hose, clean the floor first. Okay? And if your, whole, if your floor is sloped to a drain, the best way to do it is to wash it one way and then roll it towards the drain so that it's already working its way that way. Twist the swivel in soapy water to make sure that it gets all the debris and crap out of it. Clean the threads with a nice stiff bristle brush on the thread side of it to get everything out of there. And like I talked earlier, let's plug replace. Make sure we inspect those gaskets by putting them between our fingers and making sure that they're viable. And replace them if they're not. If that couple is difficult to spin, you know, the uh, washing machine that you're using is probably insufficient because it's not really worried about that. So we just use a nice stiff bristle brush with warm soapy water. Uh, you know, lubricate them on a regular basis and replace the gasket if you need to. So let's talk about some hose appliances and some hose tools. So we've got valves. We've got four different types of valves. We've got a ball valve, a gate valve, a butterfly valve, and a clapper valve. So where are we going to find ball valves at mainly? On what? Quarter turns. Ball valve. Quarter turns on? On the hydrant valve? Yeah. Hydrants are actually more probably a butterfly style, I would think, because they're because they're coming up. It's a screw style. It's actually a plug. No, no, I mean the the two and a half. Yeah, the two and a half. Okay. The, okay. Yep. The, that would be one. No, I'm sorry. No, he said hydrant. I'm like he couldn't think what I was thinking, and I couldn't I'm think what he was thinking. Right. I'm actually thinking about that. Our, oh God, I just lost my train of thought. Nozzles. <laughs> Nozzles. Nozzle is usually just a button, just a, a ball valve. Okay, you open it up, it rolls that ball open, closes it. Okay, so <coughs> gate valves, gate valves, I would think more, you know, and hydrant valve, hydrant connections. That sometimes is your gate valve. Butterflies, where are we gonna find those at? Those are your appliances, your your Ys and stuff like that. And clappers, uh, the most common clapper valve I can think of is going to be on a um, deck gun. When you bring it down and you make the connections on it, there's, a cla there's clapper valves in there so that if you're only using one section of two and a half in it, it forces the other side closed and vice versa. But if you're connecting on both, it keeps them wide open. So our valve devices, we've got the Y valve. Um, that's our most common. Uh, I think most everybody's probably got one of those. The Siamese, uh, I couldn't even tell you if I've ever seen one in line in real. Well, then you haven't gone through the truck good enough because we have one. Well, I've been through the pump <laughs> once. That's your fault. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry. Any? 
Did you have to bring it? <laughs> <laughs> me. She paid you? All right. Do we have a water thief then? Are you sure? I've never heard that term. Apparently you never read the chapter then. No, I didn't. You really want to know. LDH, what's that stand for? Large diameter hose. Large, Large diameter hose. Hydrant valves, uh, fittings are going to be in our adapters and our reducers, intake strainers, uh, that's what we attach to the drafting end of hoses. Um, you got two different styles, you got low level and floating. Uh, floating is the one that we use to prevent getting any debris from the bottom of a lake or river. Um, low level is what we use when we're dealing with porta tanks, and swimming pools and stuff like that. Hose rollers, um, hose jackets, hose clamps. Uh, hose clamps are probably our most prevalent thing that we have in our, our service around here just because hose rollers and hose jackets take up room and it's not something that we use on a common basis. Never stand over the handle of a hose clamp when applying or releasing it. The handle or frame may pop open and swing upward, upward violently. That's why we also call them the ball breaker. Because if they break, if it breaks through free and you're standing above it, yep, you're gonna feel it. So, hose tools that we need to know about: the spanner, hydrant wrench, rubber mallets. I don't know. Ain't no wall breaker for me. <laughs> Still hurt. Still hurt. Call the hoo-ha breaker. There we go. That's what we we'll call it now. Dude. Break that out. It's the hoo-ha breaker. <laughs> That's what we got in here. <laughs> so, spanner wrench, everybody knows what those are. Everybody knows where they're located on a truck. Um, hydrant wrench, you can have them in multiple locations, usually in a hydrant bag for our hydrant connections. Uh, rubber mallets, pretty prevalent right next to where we're going to make our truck connection for the intake side. Hose bridges, hose ramps, something that we would use <coughs> if we had to lay the hose across the street. Excuse me, and we weren't able to close the road down, so we still have vehicles driving through to help us protect our, our hose from that damage. Uh, chicken yeah. block, we talked about that pretty quick. That's the block that we're going to put on the, the hose right as it comes off the truck uh, just to protect it from abrasion and that. <coughs> hose straps, rubber <coughs> chains. Um, hose straps would be something that we'd use <coughs> on attack lines kind of help us just especially that that two man takes a little bit of pressure off of them so puts instead of putting all the pressure and all the work in their hands uh, can put some more work on their shoulders and using their back a little bit more and an LDH roller so let's talk about yeah let's go ahead and talk about hose rolls here and then we'll take a break after that one the simplest of all hose rolls, hose rolls. Okay, this is one that we've probably done a hundred times, and you might be the rookie and still done it a hundred times. Okay, mail threads on the inside, you just roll it just as it says. Why do you keep putting the lid back on that? Why don't you just leave it off? Because I'm, I'm bad enough that that'll happen, okay? That's why the lid goes on every time. Because I will walk over to grab it and it'll be like, oh, shit. So, and all these holes rolls we will go out and work on. Um, last testing site that I did, that was the one that got picked. So, I could, I've, I've never seen a happier bunch of guys when I said, give me a single hose roll. So, the donor roll. Notice that the male thread is still protected in it. Um, basically, we start not quite in the middle of the hose. Um, we just make a small little fold in the hose. Um, actually, it's laid on top of each other with the male end slightly closer to you than the female end is. And you just roll it on itself. And as you bring it in, it'll end up protecting that male end. Um, and then leave the female end exposed. The twin donut roll uh, is probably one of the only hose rolls that we use that the, the male end is exposed. Um, 
This one actually uses a rope or some webbing to carry it with. Um, there is one that's the self-carrying donut roll that uses the hose itself as the carrying the, the ability to use the ability to carry it with its own self, just like that. Don't start with me. Just show the picture. You don't have to explain. <laughs> Okay, let's take about a five minute break here real quick. What are the host jokes now? Host jokes? We have, we have boo jokes. <laughs>